I'm Louise Fausko and I'm the founder and director of Art 2030, the nonprofit organization connecting art and the United Nations 17 Global Goals for Sustainable Development. It is a pleasure to be here today, together with artist collective Superflex, Bjørnstjen Christiansen, Jakob Fenger, Rasmus Nielsen, together with biodiversity professor Carsten Rabeck, on the occasion of the Interspecies Assembly by Superflex and Art 2030. Each year in September, humanity meets in the United Nations headquarters in New York for an annual General Assembly session. Decisions on important questions such as on peace, security, human rights and the state of the planet are made. In September 2021, Superflex and Art 2030 are launching the first ever gathering of humans and other species to address the future of our planet. The Interspecies Assembly brings together an agenda, representatives and a resolution as a proposal for change. Launched during the UN General Assembly, the project will include a large-scale nighttime projection on the facade of the United Nations headquarter building and a monumental installation in Central Park. The agenda, Jacob. The pink marble sculpture placed in Central Park stands as an icon of hope and monument of the first time in history where all species are invited to gather, listen to each other, to decide our shared future, an agenda for a better world. Could you elaborate on the stone material and the pink tone? Uh, well, I guess maybe starting off by saying that we thought it was sort of unfair not to invite everybody to this assembly, uh, which is held by the UN. So we wanted to make our own assembly on the side where we invite all species to participate. Uh, obviously, when we as humans uh, want to invite the other ones that doesn't really have a language like we do, uh, it's important that we actually stay a little bit silent. So the, the sculpture formation is a, it's a circle of sculptures of uh, a, a type of pink marble um, that, that forms a circle. And within that circle, there are certain rules that, that uh, counts. Um, and the foremost rule, of course, is that humans too uh, remain idle. So we go into this uh, place and we have to uh, observe, we have to listen, and we have to be idle to understand the other uh, partner in this uh, game um, as good as we can. Um, the stone material is sort of, you know, it's, as, a, as artists, it's of course interest, interesting to have these kind of uh, challenges where we have to uh, exp uh, imagine somebody else uh, without actually being able to, to talk to them. And I think that is a, that is a sculptural challenge that we, um, we try to solve in different ways. Uh, one way, of course, is that we, um, in a lot of research, we found out that the color pink uh, is the preferred uh, color for polyps, uh, the ones that are the architect in the ocean that forms uh, corals. They prefer pink from black and white and whatever other colors. So we took that color as a symbol of, of, uh, of uh, a starting point for, for conversation. Um, then foremost, uh, there's also, um, which is also something we learned in the, uh, which is also becomes a sculptural principle, is that um, the, surface is, uh, the, um, the surface is the interface, which means that uh, for a lot of species, especially under the, in the ocean, uh, hard surface is uh, what matters. And that's what they, they go to, and that's where they can stick, and that's where they can live. So within the uh, configuration of uh, the stones, there's also holes and small caves in the stones that kind of allow other uh, species to live. Time is also very central, too. Of course, I mean, when, when we, as humans, we have like, lived on this planet for a very short time in comparison to other species, and also to the material that we're using, which is stone. And for us, the stone is sort of a, it's like a time traveler. So it's like somebody, it's, a, it's an entity or it's, it's something that has been on the planet way before we were here. Uh, and they will probably also be a way long time after we have left. Um, and uh, as such, we think it's a very important material to use when we want to communicate about this bigger issue. Um, so within the configuration, uh, um, the configuration is made out of stone, this uh, marble uh, stone material, 
and has engraved a text that we kind of want to pass on also to the future. The representatives, Rasmus, the uh, Interspecies Assembly invites the Cynosophores as delegation of other species, the representatives of the biosphere, the silent majority. And they are invited into the assembly with a nighttime appearance on the facade of the UNHQ. Um, it also seems like um, that the migration, the vertical migration of the Sonophores stands as a metaphor for what will happen to millions of people around the world due to rising sea levels. Um, perhaps you would elaborate on that? Every night in the oceans of the world, there is the biggest biological migration happening, uh, where the siphonophores and other species basically go towards the surface to feed. And then at dawn, they go back to the deep again. And um, it is a phenomena that, phenomena that we, we uh, witnessed during an expedition. And it's like being on another planet. Because these uh, creatures, uh, they look a little bit like aliens. So it, it's pretty mind-blowing. Um, and it's massive. And it's a sort of reoccurring vertical migration that happens every night. Um, and in a way, as Jakob was saying, with the interspecies assembly, it seems as if we, we sort of forgot to invite someone. And uh, so we thought this creatures, these creatures, the siphonophores, would be a, a, a brilliant sort of ambassador for the silent majority in the oceans of the world, since they are in a way performing something that we will probably also have to consider as humans. Uh, since even though we behave very well and don't uh, fly too much around and, and eat in specific ways, etc., etc., probably a lot of us will have to migrate vertically over the next couple of centuries. Uh, so we are sort of mirroring that on the facade of the United Nation, uh, this sort of silent vertical migration, um, which is also very hypnotic, I would say. It's, it's also meant as a way at the General Assembly to sort of fall into another species. Uh, and siphonophores are not like panda bears. They are unusual creatures. But the magic thing about them is that you, you can almost identify with them if you look at them for a long time. And that's the sort of experience we'd like to sort of uh, give uh, at, the, at the assembly, like the uninvited guests. Suddenly they're here and they're kind of cool. So they are also um, a picture of these uh, symbiotic living between different uh, species. The symbiotheme? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they, they are like the closest probably we will get to meeting an alien in our lifetime. Um, but they are not bodies in the same way as we sort of think of ourselves, in the sense that in one siphonophore you can almost have several persons. Even the idea of a person doesn't really make sense. It's more of uh, one singular siphonophore, you could say almost has the character of being a colony, where they sort of different entities work together with a common goal, which is at night time to go this way upwards and at dawn to go that way and, and then feed in the meantime. And then we've also cast it as a very specific one, um, which was the most magical one. Uh, that hunts in a way where it kind of spreads its tail, so it sort of looks like the Milky Way, like a sort of giant spiral. Uh, so it'll be sort of a, an introduction to a specific character that is, uh, I would say, we like to think of it as, uh, as an ambassador for the siphonophores at the United Nations General Assembly. Yeah, Björn Stjerne, the resolution. A call to action is carved into the stone of the agenda. The contract for the Interspecies Assembly to be in action for our future. Uh, the inaction that human representatives are called upon is to be idle um, and become active listeners and viewers 
to the earth and their surroundings. Please share more with us about the idling time, why idling time is so important. Um, <clears throat> I think several of us have already expressed that, uh, that uh, time is of the essence, uh, also meaning that uh, when we want to learn, want to listen, also in a conversation here, you need to uh, step back, you need to uh, be silent. Uh, and in that silence and in that listening, you also learn to cultivate, uh, hopefully, and then you can also act. Um, so that's a, it is a call to act, but a call to act uh, first needs uh, listening. Um, and uh, the term idle is, uh, is interesting because it can be understood in many ways. Um, but for us, it's very much that uh, the human is, uh, is, uh, is put in the center here, the singular human. Um, and we use a contract, uh, the contract uh, format, uh, which is an agreement um, between all species and the human. Um, and all the species, uh, the human is part of all species, of course, the human race. Um, but the singular human, when the singular human enters, uh, it has, by entering, also uh, uh, agreed to the terms set out in the contract, um, that I am here now to be idle for minimum five minutes. And uh, how you are idle is up to you. Um, but of course, there are also consequences. If you are not able to be idle, then uh, you, can, uh, you can be kicked out by the other species, by the other humans. Um, or you can also take the, take the time then to add on. So you are then uh, five, 10, 20, more time. So you need, you need more time then to be able to cultivate, to be able to listen. Um, so idle is, a, idle is a moment where you are, where you are put on pause. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and for those reasons I just mentioned, it, it is one of the most important uh, aspects of, uh, of life also, that, that you listen, you learn, uh, you cultivate uh, before you then act. Humans tend to always want to, to make resolutions and uh, think those are the solutions. Uh, they are of course super important to have as a, as a, as a collective uh, mindset, as a collective uh, goal, like the agreement or the R2030 goals. We set goals, we set terms, we want to go there, we want to reach somewhere. Uh, often it's very difficult for us to, uh, to manage, um, but maybe it's easier when it's a singular relationship, like the, all the species and the singular human, that you can maybe easily then uh, understand and also act. So the format of a contract is, a, is, a, is, is an agreement with consequences also. Um, so, so, and that is then inscribed into the, into the interspecies assembly, the, the, the stones. Uh, you can choose to stand outside or you can enter. And by entering, you also agree and acknowledge uh, the condition and you then start learning and listening uh, to those who are not there yeah. um, or normally don't have a voice, sorry. Um, yeah, and you agree to give time to agree reflect to time. And, crit and critical issues. Yeah. Time, time seems to be uh, the one uh, very valuable uh, factor that, that we can give uh, as humans. Um, and it can also be measured, yeah. which maybe is also interesting. Mm -hmm. So of course, both uh, playful, uh, but also relating to how we, how we uh, act uh, in our lives. Uh, I only have five minutes. It's normally a term that everyone uses. Uh, you only, only get five minutes if it's an interview. So now we are setting then five minutes, but they can be uh, added, uh, or you can also choose to add more to it. And usually we can always give five minutes. We, we uh, yeah, let's see, let's see. But it's definitely, uh, there's, there's some uh, terms set uh, for entering and partaking. Yeah. So Carsten, we are at a planetary emergency and time is running out. Uh, as professor of macroecology and head of the center of macroecology, evolution and climate. You are a leading figure in global issues such as biodiversity, climate change and pandemic. I know that time is also a very important issue for you. Yes. Um, I like this idea about the five minutes. We tend to as humans to determine everything over a very short time, a few years or, or maybe you know, four or five years. But in fact, life on Earth has a, a, a history of millions of years. Um, 
And we sometimes have a, 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 a wrong perspective on, on what determines things on life. It's very quick, but nothing is acting quick uh, out there. It might be quick what we're destroying, but it's going to take millions of years to rebuild it. If we also have the saying that if you stand still in an area, and everything will come to you eventually. Maybe not in a very short time, but when you give, if you give time. So for example, we have at the Zoological Museum in Copenhagen, we have a light uh, trap uh, on the top of the building in the middle of Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And we have just turned it on every day and then gone out to see what kind of moth, moth that's gonna be there. And we have basically found uh, four quarter, no, yeah, 80% uh, of all species of moth on the rooftop wow. in Copenhagen, <clears throat> given time. Yeah. So that's the other thing. Uh, things are moving and moving around. And uh, when we talk about climate change, and we talk about then, you know, the people that need to migrate up, but what we're also forgetting is that uh, the, the 10 to 15 million species that we're sharing Earth with also have to move around. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we, 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 we say that species are not on the run, but they are on the move. Mm. And, and we need to think about how we maintain and manage Earth so not only ourselves will survive in these uh, changes, but also the species that inhabit the Earth with us can move around. And that's a problem when we have destroyed 70% of all nature and ecosystems uh, because species has gone through dramatic climate change in the past and basically caused no extinction. The difference today is that in the past they could move around in, in virgin habitat. Today we have infrastructure and humans everywhere, so that's a problem. Uh, that, uh, but everything needs to move around. And, and, and the other thing that I'm fascinating about, about this uh, uh, artwork is that it, it tells a history that we in it together. Um, we have a tendency when we are using Earth and over exploitations and, and, and causing a, a, a climate change that it's, we, we're kind of behaving a little bit like we're living on another planet and Earth is something we're using but it has no consequences. Mm -hmm. from that. So I like this idea that we actually bring biodiversity and species and people together and it's worth thinking about. But why biodiversity? Why is that so vital? What does it mean to me and everybody? Uh, I like to breathe. Mm -hmm. uh, oxygen is uh, produced by plants. We are removing the greenness uh, of Earth. Uh, water is essential to us. Uh, it's essential to our health. Uh, you die if you don't get water. Uh, we, uh, all our textile uh, industry, uh, beers, requires a lot of water. Water is uh, is not Save produced. Save the beer. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> Save it's the, the beer. But the water, beer and the beer. But we do not produce water in factories. We produce plastic bottles, and then we go out in nature and get clean water and put on the plastic bottles. So basically, we're selling plastic, but nature is providing, as we can say, a free service, clean water. So when we go to the toilet and flush out. It is not cleaned sufficiently. It goes into the ecosystems, and ecosystem cleans up the water, and it returns. And due to uh, destruction of ecosystems, we are losing part of this function. And due to more people on Earth, we uh, over the last 40 years, we only have half as much clean water as we used to have. Water has become a scarcity. We also like to uh, to fish in the oceans. Uh, fish is not produced by factories and put out in the ocean for us to catch. It comes out there. 70% um, of all agricultural uh, products requires pollinations from insects. 9% uh, of all food that is produced in the world requires wild uh, pollination. When economists is looking at all these free services, uh, which we take for granted because we don't go down in the supermarket and buy it, so we think it's for free, but we're destroying it. It's going to be very costly to come up with, to, uh, to produce it in factories. So when the economist has looked at what is the value of the services uh, or the contribution from nature to humans, then it uh, amounts to 50% of the uh, uh, gross uh, 
um, uh, global uh, product that uh, humans are consuming every year. We get 50% of everything we get and consume every year for free for nature, but we're destroying that uh, surface. So it's also about us, and it's about the contribution from nature to humans. But there's a reverse part of the contract. That is, uh, what are we doing to, uh, to nature? Are we in ethical and moral right to uh, cause other species to go extinct? I think it's interesting what you're saying, that are we at all entitled to set those rules and terms and uh, vision based on our uh, ideas or uh, our wishes for a future? Uh, and that's what we are trying to hear. Yeah. Trying to flip it around to, set, to let someone else uh, communicate or be active and then we listen. Of course, they cannot speak, but then we have to learn to listen. And that is the most difficult task. Mm. We often like to talk about change of perspective. Uh, and then our brains are very uh, good at uh, imagining, uh, making stuff, uh, but very, very not so good at uh, then also cultivating what we, what we learn from others, because they are, as we say, maybe not so relevant yeah. to us. Not nature, yeah. but we are nature, aren't we? Yes. Uh, we are. Yeah. Our success comes from being part of nature. I mean, we do not live in an artificial world that is all you know, human-made. Uh, so, so we depend on, on this natural world, uh, but we might not have been... I think we've been in for a, a ride uh, where we have all exploited all these things without realizing what, how much we depend on, on, on nature. And we start realizing that now. I mean, climate change is, is one way to telling us the, the, the loss of, 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 of biodiversity is now starting to have consequences. We're looking at it. So it, it gives us a, a, a it's important that we, we maybe stop up a little bit and, and think about what is the consequences, because it might have gone very well for, for you know, a couple of thousands of years. But also the species that we are pushing to the brink of extinction They've been around for a, mil a million years or more, and we are now causing species to go extinct within 50 years. Uh, that might be a long time for us, but for Earth, that's a very quick time. So we have dramatic... The, 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 the mass extinction that we have right now, we've had, uh, is, is what we call it the sixth period of mass extinction. And, and mass extinction is enormously rare on Earth. So in the in five billion history, years of history, we've, we've had five periods before. And the last one was 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs disappeared. So it hasn't happened in 65 million years. But right now we are living in it. The difference is that in the past, it was caused by uh, a plate tectonic, a climate change, caused by uh, volcanic act activities on asteroid hitting Earth. Right now, it's one of the 15 million species that is causing the mass extinctions of, every, of, of all the other ones, and that's us, humans. So being in the middle of the Anthropocene, the Symbiocene mm -hmm. could be um, a future scenario uh, coming out of the interspecies assembly. That would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think there's, uh, there's an understanding of our own role that is changing. And I think that's a, a good thing. Uh, I would say that we as artists come from one of the more problematic professions in, in all of this, in the sense that uh, if you look at Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, this kind of a Jim Morrison character mm -hmm. in a circle, where you know the human body as the sort of end goal of anything, all aesthetics, you know, the, the, the difference between the proportions can then be mirrored in constructions, in architecture, and, and, and everything, you know, is, is basically here because I am an image of God. Mm. And uh, I think the Vitruvian man is breaking up. Uh, and that's a good thing because uh, we are not the sort of end goal of, of, of all of this. And even like if you look at, at people like us, professionally educated artists, etc., etc. I mean, we have to sort of break that image too, because we are one of the sort of uh, producers of it and replicators of it. Um, and sort of maybe come to more of an understanding, uh, which sounds a bit banal, but it's, it's, it's so true that we are not alone. 
but but it's interesting with the pandemics because I think it's it's done a couple of good things uh, in addition to what you just mentioned. I, I think that uh, most people have realized we're biological organisms and we're not separated from the rest of nature and we are not necessarily in control and there are consequences to what we do. Yeah, but it's a strange thing because every time we've experienced this kind of you're not in control, you're not the center of everything, there's been opposition. I mean, from Galileo, mm -hmm. battle with the Catholic Church, you know, the earth is, everything is not centering around the earth, you know, we are actually centering around the sun. Um, to uh, Freud, sort of, you know, you're not really in control of your mind, that's mm -hmm. the subconscious. Uh, to other sort of revelations, every time there's been a sort of opposition. No, 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 we are in control. And then there's been a period of sort of recognizing that actually not being in control expands our world quite a lot. Suddenly you sort of, you know, wow. Suddenly you, you see everything else around you and, and it opens your world. Whereas it maybe was thought of as a sort of limiting factor. Mm. What happens with, with, if we are not in control, you know? It's actually a cool thing. To sort of engage with other species in, and recognize their power over you also. Yeah, it, it's, it's a little bit about also realizing that we are in some kind of interaction symbiotic with, with other organisms. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not in control, but, but, but we tend to be so afraid of not being controlled. Maybe we should uh, start realizing that you know, being symbiotic can bring a lot of good things uh, mm -hmm. with it. If it was a party, it's a more fun party. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. Who wants to just? We are yeah. interdependent, yes. really. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. uh, I mean, we have the scientific fact. This is really important. Um, so, um, how is the bridge between art and science? So, in my role as scientist, I work on trying to understand how Earth operates and how nature operates and what's the consequences of what human can do. And and when politician ask me, I've been serving as a, as a, a scientific advisor to, to the government in my country, Denmark. I served to the EU presidency. I've been sitting in all kinds of science boards, writing the recommendations, scientific knowledge. But scientists should not determine what should happen. Mm -hmm. That people should decide that. So there's been a fairly passive communication of knowledge from the scientific world. I think we need to move in the direction of much more interactions. Now we talk about symbiotic, I mean, between politicians and people and artists. And to me, it is a decision, our future is a decision of, uh, of what uh, our people want. And people think many, many different ways. And I think, and this is why I, 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 I love interaction with scientists, because I think artists can communicate in, 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 in quite different ways. I don't think this is a cold-hearted scientific fact decision we are on here. We are, it's, it's a very uh, uh, emotional uh, and it's, it, it's humanity. And I think artists can reach in different ways than scientists can do uh, people's mind. And it's also about, you know, get people to think and reflect. Uh, and, 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 and that's why I, I like these interactions and, and what that can be done. Because all good forces from the different perspectives that can contribute is, is so heavily needed. The playfulness is, uh, is often where you open up uh, perspectives. Your mind is a little more uh, curious yeah. and, 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 and you act it out and you also fail. Yeah. There's no problem in failing in a game if it's playful. Yeah. Uh, it's when, it, if, when, if you, if, when you're pressured and you have to deliver becomes uh, more difficult to play and perform and, uh, and, and, and make mistakes. So I think, but when you said before, art and science, I think what you asked, what you asked about before actually was that art is also communication. Uh, so it's not only words, and particularly not here at the Interspecies Assembly, yeah. because the only words are those the humans can read when they enter, it's the conditions, but then it is to then understand and listen, but without words, yeah. to all the other species. And that's where, uh, that's where we then can, uh, we come in as artists to, to, to set, uh, set some conditions, like a sculptural infrastructure, here yeah, that people can then act within. Uh, so it is architecture uh, to understand a certain setting, but hopefully it's then also architecture for an interspecies living, 
uh, for those who are on land and also when, when water is rising. So that's, a, that, that's a, in a way, it's a, it's a simple approach mm -hmm. that we need to set some conditions, and this is also in sculpture material, to be able to, to, to allow ourselves to have that uh, interaction, mm -hmm. which is an interaction based on idleness, on silence, on pause. Um, so that's where we meet also in, in with the scientific knowledge, like Rasmus says, uh, Alex Jordan and so on, what you say, and then, and then we then formulate a setting that is the sculptural setting or an infrastructure for having that moment. Looking at the General Assembly and looking at science, art and the, the society at a broader level, um, are there room for, for optimism onwards? I am very, very optimistic mm -hmm. and I'm optimistic because science, uh, we are at a level where we know what is going wrong. We also need, know what uh, is needed and I, I, I see with this general assembly that uh, there, are, there is an understanding among politicians uh, that it's necessary to act, but the difficult thing is that uh, that they need to act on what our society wants. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, the, 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 that's, that's a missing piece that, uh, I mean, I, I do think on, on climate change that people got together and say, yeah, that's the serious we want to be act because we need uh, uh, transformative changes mm -hmm. and transformative changes are gonna impact us all, so we want, and we want it. Uh, and, and this comes back to why I think, you know, uh, that. That, that communication as artists could do is about that everybody needs to relate to it. If we can relate to it, and if we can agree among 130, 140 countries, because that's the tricky part, mm. uh, then we can actually deal with this. Mm -hmm. So I would be much more scared if we were sitting in a situation where we did not know what to do. But we do. It's whether we can agree upon it. Uh, and that, uh, that is up to the, the, the voice of all people, and I, I have a huge faith in humanity. So, and art changes people and people changes the world. I think the first thing to do, I mean, and I think that's what, what and why we do what we do is that, that it's time to reflect on different levels and, and this is certainly one of them. Uh, just this thing, we talked about surfaces and we talked about time and, and all these things are sort of in play in the sculpture. And obviously you, we ask people to give five minutes of idleness. It's like a, a little play, you could say, but the stone that has been there all the time is like the witness. So it's kind of watching these humans trying to do something for five minutes to make a better world. The thing is, of course, for us, it's trying to, by putting these things like sort of a, to a boiling point or to a place where, I mean, you ask for very little things to change in your life uh, because the whole world is kind of falling apart. It's kind of a, it's a game and hopefully an, an eye opener uh, to some that we actually have to act and we have to do stuff. Because it is like serious issues, of course, though we are playful, though we are whatever we are. But it's always uh, also a matter of then persuasion. How are you able to persuade someone? to actually give time, to consider, to listen. And again, even though it sometimes is a, maybe a negative thing to try to persuade someone, uh, I think it is, it is a valid and strong tool that we, among others, use often. Mm -hmm. So you may, like, you may think that the sculpture looks cool, you know, that the color is beautiful, or it's in this uh, great place, uh, Central Park. Uh, but as soon as you then enter, or then you are of course open. If you see a great color, you are inspired, you move in, and then you go in, and then, then you are caught. You know, then you are, then everyone is looking at you. If you if you uh, if you agree to the terms that all the other species are looking at you, right? And that is the trigger point where we where we are playing with here. Is it possible to make people within that assembly, the structure, to look at all these species who are, as you say, there? There's a at night time. If we would also study, make this a trap, you would have all kinds of insects and so on also be visible and be present. And this is, of course, our imaginary power that we look at them, we see them. Uh, that is the abstract part. That's why I say communication, but also persuasion. Mm. And this sculptural setting, which is beautiful. It's fantastic made, beautiful marble. It's uh, an old material that we trust. Also, I think most people trust this because it looks great. 
Um, and at that moment, you can you can have the, the conversation. Uh, also, yeah. through just listening, you don't need to say anything. There's a conversation. Yeah. Um, but I think to answer Luis's question also, I, I think I mean humans are a peculiar kind, mm. and and one thing we do know is that they don't purely uh, work on the basis of facts. I mean you that I mean facts changes a little bit, but but you can't really run anything on the basis of of facts. Um, so in that sense, uh, we have this. Uh, capacity to be storytellers um, and mythologies and, and, and stories have been sort of game changers in terms of how we look at the world uh, as well as facts have been um, but they kind of work in, 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 a, in a strange kind of ping pong um, but absolutely I mean through almost a kind of a ecstasy of, of storytelling art can, can, can actually change things and maybe Maybe things is the wrong word. Actually, it can change you. It can change your yeah. reading and perspective of the world. And that's the sort of a, that's why it, 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 it's actually a strong drug, which is also why that uh, in, in various kinds of uh, dictatorships, it has been kept under strict control mm. from the old the Greeks to Stalin to Hitler to... Yeah, that's uh, actually why I mean, it, because art changes people, yes. but people change the world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but these people knew that, you know, this is dangerous stuff here and, and you know, we need to keep it under control. Uh, so, of course, uh, and, and humans are also, I think, kind of always searching for, for this sort of, um, I mean, we like to drink wine and, and beer and stuff and, 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 and some people like drugs as well. We, we like ecstasy, the ecstasy of life that changes ourselves and it's almost like we have it built into us that we want to feel this change of perspective through doing various kinds of, uh, I don't know, sometimes we dance also to sort of get into sort of a different reading of, of our circumstances. And, and I, I think art is just one of those sort of game changers, uh, along with others. I, I like your point. Of, uh, we, we often think that humans are very rational. One thing I learned from my research is that humans are not rational. I've, I spent 20 years together with economists to come up with optimal solutions. And, and then you can enforce that by politics or taxations. And then you, you think that people will act in the rational way that will benefit themselves. And what we found out with all these optimal solutions that we actually spent 20 years on climate change, all, that people are not behaving that way. So a lot of the things that builds on the rationality uh, doesn't work. Uh, so, so that's a human mindset of, you know, what are we reacting to? And, and I think in order to get to some of these solutions, we need to, to embrace that irrationality mm -hmm. that, that each one of us has. And it's different. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's part of the solution, to, to em embrace that. Mm -hmm. Act idle and, and see what happens, right? Uh, then you start listening and then you can cultivate and then... Uh you know, uh, we, we may uh, experience uh, irrational things, uh, but also be able to, uh, to uh, again, act. Um, that's what we like to call it, act idle also. Um, and inactive is also an interesting word, but uh, what does that mean, right? Uh, many will say, what is inactive? Um, and those things are then carved in stone, and then you can think about it for centuries uh, or five minutes. Um, so give five minutes, is the last remark from here. I look forward to sign the contract and go in and give my five minutes and to see what comes to my mind in that silence conversation. Wow, it's like the final, uh, <laughs> final words on Spaceship Earth. <laughs> 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 um, uh, you didn't prep us for this, uh, <laughs> Louise. Um, no, I, I think fundamentally we are also a scientist and, and some artists around this table, and I think facts are fun. Yeah. And I also think art is fun. Mm -hmm. And I think those two things coming together is funnier. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is actually, it, it, it expands the human scope, and we can actually do both. Um, so in this, on, around this table, that's my humble sort of uh, 
sort of feeling and, and I feel a lot of joy of, of sort of having having that sort of ping pong mm. uh, with with you guys. Mm. Maybe just let's try to avoid these sculptures being this kind of last scene in uh, Planet of the Apes where they say, oh no, how could you do it? I mean, yeah. let's uh, try to fix things. Um, we have a lot of knowledge. We have a lot of uh, playful minds. Um, we have imagination, we are irrational, we should be able to do something. 